go here, put in more. You know, um, my wife says, quit leaving your intern up here. This is not funny. Making him feel like he's going to have to do it without you. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. Let's, uh, I got more for you, so. All right, so um, these clipboards. Let me get you some pens there. And pass them around for you to sign up for. There's a lot of different things here, okay? There's a lot of different things. All right, start at the beginning. The first one is you better talk right here. There's some people that, that are deep. Deep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's going to help us today. Um, he'll be preaching yeah. on Wednesday night. Uh, and uh, so he's going to help us today. He's in charge of announcements and introduction and that kind of stuff. And so there you go. <laughs> so the first um, foot bulletin thing is the Thanksgiving Senior Meal Sign Up. It's uh, November 19th. 2015 at 11.30 a.m. And I guess you just sign up for one of these things listed. There's a uh, turkey, cooked or sliced, sweet potatoes, stuffing, cranberries, mashed potatoes, um, rolls, and pork, gravy, sauerkraut, pumpkin pie. So I'll just pass this one out first. <laughs> Uh, the second one is the Soup Sunday, November 22nd. Um, <laughs> uh, you can sign up for <laughs> sign up for soups, desserts, crackers, drinks, sandwiches, rolls, or candles. Um, the third one is just the church directory. So there's a place to check mark in the box next to your name if everything's spelled and right is correct. Um, you can cross or write some corrections if your name isn't right. So I'll give you this one over here. Uh, the first and fourth one is the bar recital. Um, I'm just going to pass this out. The name, just write your name. And a number of pending if you want to um, recite something. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you're doing well, we're going It's just a piano and. Yeah, piano. So it's just a piano free yeah. recital. If you, if you like to come in 10. If you like to come in 10, um, November 13th at 6 30 p.m. to her, okay? 
okay? Um, and this is something that we uh, have offered to the family. Um, they, they did not uh, come to me and say, uh, what about cleaning, though they have been talking about uh, the possibility of trying to figure out ways to take some off of one of the daughter-in-laws who uh, is doing some of the cleaning. Um, and uh, we said that we thought it would be worthwhile for us to do that as a church because she needs to have people in and out on a constant basis to keep her from getting up and doing things and to talk to her and to make it to where um, the family isn't uh, having to run 24-7 uh, over there to, to see her. So now um, in talking to Rita, the daughter, um, she said rather than us doing what we would normally do, the three meals, um, that she would prefer that we have one meal where you, you make it uh, enough to where, you know, she can eat on it for a couple of days and uh, also um, a soup that she can heat up for lunches and whenever something's not there. Um, because, uh, you, you know, the, the Algorismas and Anne and, um, and also Ron and Kara, they are, anytime they're going through and have a meal, they're dropping it off. And so it's not a set day that we need to do this. It's more of the idea, if you feel like you can take it on Tuesday, you write down on there, I'm going to go on Tuesday, and we're doing two a week. We prefer one to be a soup and one to be a meal, but if you can only do a meal and that's the week you can do it, then do two meals. The Lord will take care of it. Um, and then if you'd like to, to sign up to clean, I will tell you, with the meticulous, she's going to demand that things be done her way. Okay, and, and sometimes that might um, uh, appear like it's, um, uh, that she's not appreciative, but she's a very appreciative woman. She's a sweetheart. You just have to get to know her and, and see down below that. Uh, just, you know, when you go in, do whatever she asks, and, and it will encourage her. But she needs to stay off her feet. So tell her, sit down. Sit down. I'm going to take care of this. You tell me what to do, and I'll take care of it. But tomorrow when I deliver the soup, we're going to inform her that the church is going to come in and do this. And we're going to do it for two months for now um, because uh, she needs to be off her feet for these stress fractures to heal for, for over a couple of months. Um, and uh, so that's one reason why Rita said maybe let's not, not do what you're, you're suggesting of the three a week. Let's do more like two to make it where we're not taxing plus the family is bringing in a lot of meals and things. And um, they, that way we're helping out and making it where it's not a constant burden. When we're done sending around the sheet, I will send that to um, both Rita and Kara so that they know um, what's happening. And uh, when you guys are saying you're going to come, and that will help them as well. Okay? Um, so we'll, we'll take care of that. All right. As far as uh, other announcements, we'll let John do those in a few minutes and then let him re-collect uh, his thoughts. Um, he's doing a good job. Let's go ahead and sing together number 495. Number 495. Great reading my writing? Yes. 495. Count your blessings. Let's stand together and sing.
together here. We thank you for the church that you have gathered. We thank you for each family member that's been able to make it today. We pray for those who, who can't. Maybe they're away traveling. Maybe they're homesick. Maybe not feeling great. But Lord, we pray that you would touch and bless each and every one of them. Thank you for the Word of God and how clear it is in our own language for us to read and study and learn from. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that walks among us and touches our hearts and teaches us. And Lord, I pray that you'd open our eyes to truth today and that we would uh, make the necessary changes to be all that we should be in Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we do thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now we'll turn it back over to John who will go through some more announcements. Announcements uh, for this evening are choir practice is 5.30 to 6.30. And the Olympians and youth group will be from 6 o'clock to 7.30. And there's an adult Bible study about who is the king from 6.30 to 7.30, covering um, Daniel 2.47, 4.37, and 5.21. And some upcoming calendar events for uh, November are on the 4th of November, there will be a prayer meeting at 7 p.m. for a Truth Project Session 4. And on uh, November 6th, which is a Friday, there will be an FBC Youth Coordinate in Middletown from 5 to 10.30 p.m. And you should bring a snack to share and a flashlight. Um, on November 8th, the congregational meeting immediately after this, this service, after this service, is on November 8th. And on November 13th, there will be a piano and food recital at 6.30 p.m. featuring Terry's piano students and Rita on the flute. Light refreshments to follow and then art, um, see the RSVs PC on the black table. On the 19th of November, there will be a senior meal at 11.30 in the fellowship hall. And then on November 21st, there's the annual church cleaning day. And then the day after that, on the 22nd, there will be the Thanksgiving service and Soup Sunday. If your family would like to share a particular song in the service, see the pastor. And on the 25th, um, uh, there's a Thanksgiving Eve communion service. And that's all. <laughs> Good job, buddy. Good job. Okay, uh, let's see, I, I think uh, he was uh, pretty clear with everything there. Don't forget next week the congregational meeting immediately after. Um, John, any extra information we need for um, Friday night? Um, we need to have a count today for the corn maze. Uh, if we can get one also, um, we're going to be leaving the church at 5 o'clock. So we need to have everybody here before 5, I think of yeah, we I'm had to tell most there. people 4 30. Yeah, 4 30. So we're going to try to leave here at the church at 5. So. Are you bringing the same number back if you bought there? Uh, we're going to try to bring the same number back this year. That's the complaint about that last year. So. All right. Let's uh, go ahead and sing another song then, number 473. 473, Heavenly Sunlight.
Okay, um, I think I forgot to have John introduce his mother, so we'll have him do that when he comes up here in a minute. And uh, also, I have a card for him to read to you from a uh, request for family. Okay, um, but let's uh, give you a couple of prayer requests, and he's going to pray over the offering when we get to that point as well. Uh, first of all, don't forget to pray for Juanita um, as she's uh, dealing with uh, the reports and, and uh, her, her cancer and uh, everything that goes involved in that. We need to pray for them that they'll have wisdom on what to do, how to approach it, how to deal with it, and uh, for strength for her and for her family. And uh, so we uh, pray that you would uh, lift her up in prayer. It's very important to us. And then uh, Mr. Tim, getting better all the time. Miss Marlene is doing well, though she's not out here today. But continue to praise the Lord for their recoveries. And also pray for their continued uh, growth and strength. I think Mr. Tim goes in about a week and a half, two weeks now for his uh, report and to his test next week. Um, to get his test uh, to find out how well it's going. So let's make sure we uh, really lift that up uh, to the Lord as well. Don't forget to pray for Mrs. Ryan. Um, she's been in and out of the hospital a couple of times here lately. And so she's not feeling the greatest. We need to make sure we pray for her. And um, also, as already mentioned, pray for Miss Jenny, um, who uh, is not easily to have to sit down for a long period of time and lay still for a long period of time, but um, pray for her that she'll do well and that her hip will heal quickly, and particularly for her that the pain uh, will be controlled so that she can enjoy those times a little bit more. Um, so remember to pray for her as well. I'll never forget somebody that we should uh, have John pray for with the offering. Dave. Dave Schaefer, doing well, getting better. Was was down yesterday to see him, and um, they are working with him with the uh, rehab. Uh, his walking is not at all. Okay. But he does appreciate all the prayers. Right, right. Um, she she has the cancer. It is cancer. Yes. She's doing chemo. And she's getting ready to do chemo, yes. Um, so. We take prayer for she's been dealing with a lot of ear problems. Yes, thanks. Uh, pray for Jake. He's been having some ear issues. He even had to go to the emergency room a uh, time. And so uh, pray for him. Um, that's one of our young couples, um, kind of newer to the church uh, this time around. They've been here for four years ago, but just moved back. So pray for him. All right. John, you come, and, and uh, gentlemen, you come as well. John's going to pray over the offering, and then uh, why don't you give those this first? Uh, here's your mom before you pray. Yeah, so, first of all, Richard and Charlene Ashram's daughter, last night, asked, uh, asked for a 60th wedding anniversary card shower for them. Um, their anniversary is November 5th, and their address is 3200 Woman Lane. Union Bridge, Maryland, 21791. We'll take care of giving that to Terry so she can put it in the bullet. And that's my mom in the corner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Lydia Zalowski, she um, teaches at Crown Christian School, and she's a great mom. Uh, so All right, let's pray. All right, dear God, we thank you that we can come to church today. We thank you for the freedom and the, um, everything you give us. We pray that we won't get um, just grateful for everything you give us. We um, Please be with the tithes and offerings that you bless them, that whatever, wherever you need them to go or need them to be, that they'll go there and they'll just be used for the right things. And we pray for any prayer requests, all those prayer requests, that you will just answer them or you will just be with them. And especially for all the cancer victims right now, that you will just bless them, be with the families. I know that's a hard time for them. Just be with them. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Okay, let's sing number 109. Number 109. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand together as we sing. Really stretch your legs.
to even prove a point, even if I thought what we were arguing about was silly or whatever. This is not the way that I should put an end to the argument. Because what I actually did is I took the paddles of life and I put them to her and said, Dah! with my little mocking of imitating her. Don't do it. Don't, don't ever do it again. Don't. Don't, don't give me my voice back at me. Don't throw it. I should not do it. I want you to think about when God says you should not have. Thou shouldest not have. I want you to see this, that this is almost like a little court case today, our section. And I know I've got, um, you know, five verses we're going to look at, which is more than I normally would do in a, in a jump like this. I also know that I have eight points, which is more I would do in a jump like this. Um, I don't know if we'll make all eight today, but we'll try. Uh, but the, the main thing that I want to look at with you is, um, verse 11 is the opening statement to the trial. We're now to the place to where we're going to spell out, I've, I've given you a history lesson, but now we're going to spell out in Scripture what exactly Edom has done. Okay, and, and so uh, picture the lawyer, the prosecuting attorney, who's standing up and he's pacing before you, the jury, and he's trying to make it very clear what Edom has done. Verse 11 then says, In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. So, in his opening statement here, you have a very clear, strong idea. You stood on the other side. You, you acted like you weren't part, but you were kind of rooting us on. You're standing there watching them loot from us. I remember as a, a, a freshman out of college, we came home. And I told you a couple weeks ago, we had people rob our house. Um, I don't think I told you that our next door neighbor um, saw them robbing our house. Saw them robbing our house. But because they had hit so many houses in the neighborhood, the neighbor said, I'd rather not get involved. Or should I say her husband said, I'd rather not get involved, close the door, and come in the house. Don't call the police officers. You know, that's a pretty sad little statement. Think of even. Standing up there on the hill. They know that things are going bad and they need help. But instead of caring, they're boldly standing there and just watching. Just watching. At least in the beginning. Because it goes on and it says, They watched as strangers carried away captive his forces. So foreigners came in. Now we're talking about your brother, your cousin, whatever you want to call it. We're talking about family relations here, Edom and Israel. And Edom is standing up there saying, have at it. You can have them. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I've dealt with a couple of situations where, where people in one family, uh, an individual is doing something very wrong, and, and the whole family rallies to them and defends them rather than tells them that they need to get it right. And the statement was always, blood is thicker than... You know, whatever. What in the world? Edom is standing up there, and whether they like Israel or not, they're standing back and saying, go ahead, have at it. I don't care. Then he goes on and says, foreigners entered into his gates. Again, emphasizing, your brother is in need of help. The foreigner, the person you don't even know, is entering into his gates, and you don't care goes on and says, cast lots upon Jerusalem. And eventually he says, you were as one of them. In an opening statement, God makes it very clear. They moved from just standing on the hill and watching and encouraging and enjoying the strangers coming in and taking things, all the way down to watching them enter the gates and breach the city, to destroying things and casting lots to receive things for themselves and getting to the place to where eventually they are participating as one of them. We've read your verses throughout the scripture during our entire study here that, that, that say very clearly that Edom had a, a part in, in encouraging them to, to totally 
destroy the walls, the temple, the, the city, to knock it down. Um, we, we've told you that um, in, in uh, the Apocrypha, that we don't hold up to the same standard as the Word of God, but yet in the Apocrypha, which I think has some historical benefit, um, and the Apocrypha mentions that Edom is the one who actually raised or, or totally destroyed the temple itself. Uh, again, we don't put that on the same caliber as the Word of God, but you see what God says about them. You were as one of them. You were as one of them. Okay? Now, that was the opening statement. Now as we go through 12 uh, through 14, I want you to see the continuation of, of each one is going to have a should not have, should not have, should not have. Now look with me at verse 12. But, you did these things, but thou should not have looked on the day of thy brother. I want to tell you that these first eight things that we're going to look at all fit under the category of the day of thy brother. The day of thy brother. Again, blood should mean something to us. This is family. The day of thy brother. You know, you tolerate a lot more when it's your brother than you would when it's others, wouldn't you? You love a lot more in the end when it's your brother than you would when it's everybody else, wouldn't you? This is the day of thy brother, God's accusing them. Keep that in mind. And he says, thou should not have looked on. So the very first one is he's looking on in the day of thy brother. And what, what does it say? Uh, when, uh, in the day of thy brother, uh, when, uh, let, me, let me read from the beginning. But thou shouldst not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. It's the day of thy brother when he's becoming a stranger. Uh, I want to tell you something, friends. There, there are many times when people are in desperate need of, of a brother to, to be there. Maybe we can't get along with everyone. Maybe we can't. But they need us to be a brother and to not allow them to be carried off by the stranger, by the foreigner. But instead, we actually let them become a stranger. We give them over to it. I realize and recognize that in dealing with sin, it's very hard sometimes to know how do we draw the lines because the Bible does tell us to turn us over, turn it over to them, to, to let them just go ahead and go their way if that's what they're going to choose to do. I realize the Bible tells us that, but my my question would be: Are we just looking on and? As we continue through the story, uh, you know, excited that this is happening. Or when we look at someone who's made a grave mistake in their life, a choice that was very bad, and we offered them help and they totally refused it. I'm, I'm talking in code about something that you, most of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Absolutely refused it. Do we rejoice? in things falling apart for them? Or does it make us break in our heart for them and cause us to say, I don't want them to forever be stuck in the land of a stranger, Lord. Help them. Use this to wake them up. Just ask you. The Bible says you should not have looked on in the day of your brother. When he was made the stranger. There are so many people that you and I know who, for their own choices, have decided to make themselves strangers. Haven't they? How much did we care? Maybe we couldn't stop them, they made up their mind. How much did we care? Did it bother us? Did we pray for him? Did we try to encourage him to have the right attitude? I think many times we could say yes. Friends, I think we really need to evaluate ourselves by this principle. 
Because if God were holding court here today, what would he say? What would he say? That's part one. Number two. Number two in the same verse says, Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. So the second part is not only were you looking on in the day of your brother when he was taken and made the stranger, but now you're actually rejoicing in the fact that he was taken down. In the case that I recently uh, just talked to you about and recently went through, there are plenty of reminders around town, isn't there? When I come to things that remind me, when I do that, what is my attitude? What is my heart? Do I have the right perspective or am I rejoicing over the fall? Hmm? He says, you should not have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Even if Judah deserved it, which by the way, in the eyes of God, the reason why they're being destroyed in the first place was... Go ahead and say it. They were being punished. They did deserve it. But God says, you should not have rejoiced in the fact that I had to deal with them like that. You should not have rejoiced in that. Friend, we should love so thoroughly that it bothers us when our brother is being taken and made the stranger. It should bother us when our brother goes, but many times it's almost like, whew, finally, and we rejoice. Relationships at home, relationships at work, told you before, I've had a, a job at AT&T when I was uh, waiting on Amy to graduate from school. While at that job at AT&T, we had a, a man who came in midway through. That man came in and he, um, he, he, we worked on commissions, so you get the majority of your pay comes from how much you sell. And you rely on each other when you're working by commission that when you already started working with somebody and they come in the door and say that they're here to see you but you're busy with someone, that that person doesn't take over what you've already done all the work for, but they instead help you and it's in the moment they can hand them off to you, they do. And if not, they go ahead and complete the sale for you and, and take care of putting it in there and you help them with theirs. And that's what it's supposed to be. But we had a gentleman who came into AT&T, three of us had been there the whole time I had worked there, they hired a new guy on, and this guy would take over sales, and you, you'd have done uh, house visits and everything, going out to, to take care of things, hours and hours worth of work, and the next thing you know, here, here's a, another guy that's picking up the sale and getting the commission off of it, and he did nothing but take the final thing when he came in the door, okay? Um, AT&T uh, gets complaints from the other employees, not from me, because I'd rather just keep talking to him about, hey, man, you shouldn't be doing that. Buddy, I, I'm going to help you. You make sure you help me, okay? I, I, I'm not the type of person that goes right to the first thing, give them the hatchet, you know, that kind of thing. I, I think that we should have forgiveness and kindness and, and the Lord will take care of it in the end and, you know, so forth. Um, and, and not always has. I mean, uh, you know, I'll just tell you, when, when I left AT&T, uh, they, they kept paying me for, for a, a month. And I kept telling them I wasn't supposed to get the pay, and they said it would mess up their books. Okay, I got my money back. I'm telling you, I did. I got my money back. I, the right attitudes end up taking care of themselves. Um, but the thing is, is when he was fired, it broke my heart. I know he wasn't doing right. But he was an older gentleman that I, I think was stuck in his ways and was really having a tough time adjusting. 
And, and we're supposed to have an attitude that, that cares about that individual and helps him to adjust because he was a nice guy. But what do we do? Well, everybody almost throws a party when he's fired. That's not right. That's where we are a lot of times in Christianity. We rejoice over. The children of Edom did that with Jerusalem and Israel. Look with me, continue on in verse 12. The final one in verse 12 says, Neither should thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. The, the idea here of spoken proudly, uh, the Hebrew for spoken proudly is, is actually a word that could be translated magnified thy mouth or made your mouth loud. Um, have you ever heard the individual who, who, in the midst of a situation where there's a classroom and a lot of people are talking, who gets really loud, not because they're loud like me, but really loud for the purpose of they want you to hear that they just achieved something? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm sure we've all been in a room where somebody's done that and it annoys us, oh, come on, type idea, right? That's what they were doing. They were speaking up really loud, not because it's their normal word voice, but for the purpose of speaking proudly, letting everybody know they just achieved this. Okay? Let me ask you something. Should we be broadcasting how someone has made a mistake? Should we be, uh, you know, praying for them? Well, what should we be doing? Yet, I dare say, in the midst of problems, people tend to speak proudly, run their mouth loud and clear, and be seen. That's not what God wants. God wants us to quietly continue to pray for that person. Do what we can to help. And make a difference. I, I wish, I, I honestly mean this, I wish that I could stand up here and talk to you about case by case people that we've dealt with, that some of you know, and talk to you about their attitudes, their actions, and what they've done, and what we did, and how we've treated them, and, and praying for them to come back and feel, feel like they could be a part of things and so on. But you can't do that because people then get mad or that you're you know, doing that if you know what I'm talking about. It only makes it worse. So I can't do it. But um, I, I wish that we could because I wish that you could understand thinking through. But I want you to see what happens is, is we tend to uh, run our mouth about it. Okay? Speak proudly in, in, a, in a way that, that draws attention. Um. I don't know if you remember, um, in, in this particular case, uh, a couple of people that have um, passed away, so I feel like you can at least mention it. Um, some folks that were here when I first came that we had, had to deal with on some various things. And you remember that, that many people wanted us to um, uh, bring it up here and have, as it were, a trial, which is not a biblical thing, but a trial in front of the whole church, uh, you know, pitting what they're saying against what I was dealing with, okay? Uh, which is not a biblical thing. Um, many people calling for, uh, spell it out. Tell us exactly. But you know what? That's not what God wanted us to do. That's not how God wants us to act because the honest truth is, is those people were good people. They were good people. They're special people. And God loves them. And regardless of whether I'm trying to help them on a subject that they're struggling in or not, they still need me to love them. And so the best thing I could do is to tell you I'm not going to talk about it. I don't know if you remember that, but that's what our attitude was. I'm not going to talk about it. You just pray for them. I, I think that too often... We make the matter worse by running our mouth and in essence speaking about how proud we are that we did it right and that they didn't. When maybe the best thing we can do is just be quiet. Don't 
speak. Say nothing. Does it matter what people say when it's a lie? Nope. You know why? Truth is truth. And it always lives. It always will. I don't have to worry about it. Because sooner or later, the lies that are put over something, the truth will grow back up through it. And it will be more beautiful now. But our goal needs to be, you know what? We should not have just looked on. We need to do something. We should not have rejoiced over. We need to care. We should not have spoken proudly. We should have quietly, humbly beseeched God on their behalf. Those are the things God wants us to do. I could stop here and tell you that we have preached a thorough sermon, but the Lord's not done in this case. He's not done in this case. He has an even stronger mentality of what should be done. Keep going with me. Verse 13, Thou should not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Remember up in the opening statement it says foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. They and you cast lots upon Jerusalem. You, you remember how up in verse 11 in the, in the statement there saying they entered in and cast lots and you was one of them. Here is the, the spelling it out. Here's the making it clear. God outright says you should not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Look, we are not talking about that Edom waited five years, said Israel's not coming back, and marched down into the, the city of Jerusalem. We're talking about the fact that Edom is sacked, and in the midst of the sacking, the people who are there and encouraging it on is Edom. The people that are there who are joining the fight is Edom. You know, when someone gets to the place of destruction, are we running through the gate on that day of calamity and making sure we topple the tree, tear down the house, ruin the walls? Are we participating in it? That's what I'm asking. Are we removing the ability of that person, even if they're lying, to blame anyone but themselves? Folks, I think we could all do better with these, myself included. They entered into the gate of my people, and it was in the day of their calamity. <laughs> By the way, I don't know if you noticed, but it's everything is they looked on, uh, you know, a, an action. They looked on, they rejoiced over, they spoke proudly, and each one has the day of their brother, the day of their destruction, the day of their distress, the day of their calamity. It, it has a parallel each time. A couple of them don't, but God is now saying that you you actually are a willing participant in the destruction. You didn't just stand back and, and let it happen. You actually made it happen. You're a participant. I want to tell you, that's not what God would want. When I was a kid, not a kid, I guess that's the wrong way of saying it, a teenager, and that pastor went after me. 11th grade year. Okay? 11th grade year, he goes after me, and 12th grade year, I switched to a different school, and I, I didn't get to tell you some of the things that happened, but that year we played them, and we were the closest rival. I mean, obviously, we didn't move. I just went to a different Christian school, and we were the closest rival to these folks that I had uh, moved away from and gone to a different school, and um, they spent the week before. You usually have pep rallies before the tournament time. They had the pep rallies and everything the week they were going to play me. 
Um, they, they had students during those pep rallies talk about uh, what they would do to hurt me. Um, they had uh, many, it was a number of things that were going on in the entire process. Okay. Um, I've never seen the gym, their home place, packed as thoroughly as it was because word spread through our school from kids that were bragging. Back then they didn't have Facebook, they just called each other. Um, kids that were bragging about what they were going to do to me. Um, so the new school, kids that I had played against for all my life were showing up to support and protect me, to make sure they couldn't do anything to us. It was packed. During that game, one of the kids that was in the same class with me, I wouldn't consider him a best friend. We had different viewpoints. His dad was a pastor. And I'm not trying to be uh, mean, rude, nasty, but his dad was a worldly pastor. Okay? Um, he, he was not exactly like I am or believe. We were good friends, but not great friends, if you know what I'm trying to say. He was on the other team, and he was their leader. I was the point guard when we were together. He was the shooting guard. We did everything together type idea. In... Uh, the championship game, a few weeks after that first one when they came after me, they were after me again, and the word came out of the locker room that the other team's not going to come back out. Why not? Well, because this kid said, that's it, I'm not doing this anymore. You're going to leave him alone or I'm not playing. He was a senior then at that point as well. You know, let me ask you something. Is it my job to tear down what somebody else has done? They put up lies, they make all kinds of stuff about me. It was a rough time in my life, it really was. I told you that I was debating on whether I ever wanted to have anything to do with Christianity because of it. It was a rough time in my life. One that really hit me hard. Um, I, I was struggling because these people, when led by a pastor, had been so vindictive towards me. When I drive by there today, does my heart wish it could go in there and see? Do I wish that God would bless their ministry and that they would come back? Past year, by the way, Carol Christian played him for the first time in all the years since then. Because Mr. Beard, um, one of the leaders in our school here, had known what they were doing to me there and had insisted that a stop be put to it, and they ended up being put out of the league. I didn't have to tell them anything. Mr. Beard protected me years and years ago. I want you to know that God doesn't want us to participate in the destruction. God doesn't want us to do that. You might say, but pastor, if somebody's doing something wrong, am I supposed to just ignore it and not warn other people? Look, I'm not trying to tell you that if a Christian who says he's a Christian you go in there as a, as a mechanic and he's putting parts in that don't need to be put in and he's doing it on purpose. I'm not saying you don't warn each other, don't go to him right now, he's having a problem. But that's exactly it. It's not, don't go to him right now, he's having a problem. It's, hey, maybe we should pray for him. I remember um, here in town, uh, Mr. Davis uh, is uh, a friend of mine. He runs Lee's Automotive. And I remember having a problem at one of the local shops when they were doing an inspection where they would not pass me for something that, that it was ridiculous. Um, at Lee's Automotive, they would, uh, they, they would fix it and go back and he'd say it didn't pass. I'd come back to him and he'd say, I don't see what in the world he's talking about. It didn't pass. So, you know, I'm getting pretty steamed up. I'm getting pretty mad about it. And I want to do something about it. 
And, and Mr. Davis said, hey, Andrew, I did some checking. I did some checking. The boy that's doing this, he said, I, I don't want to accuse one way or the other, but he's going through a rough time in his life. I found out which mechanic it was. He's going through a rough time in his life, and, and um, maybe he's doing it because of what, what we know about him. And I'm not going to spell it all out to you, but I just want you to know that Sure, you could bring this up and complain to somebody and get him in trouble because he is doing something wrong, or you could just tell him you're going to have to go somewhere else and come up here and I'll, I'll take care of it and we'll help you and you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> tell me something. Which is better? Which is better? I'm not saying that I didn't say something to the young man, but it sure did change my attitude. If we are supposed to be caring about people and acting a certain way, then we shouldn't look on when they're being made into a stranger. We should not rejoice over their failures and the fact that they're getting in trouble and so on. And we should not speak proudly to make sure everybody else can see how we did something and, and, and that they're failing. We also should not enter into the gate and be a participant. Obviously, I'm not going to make the rest of them. We have another four, and I'll take care of them next time. Five, six, seven, and eight, which is the rest of um, uh, verse 13 and 14. But what I want you to see is that I think even though this is a, a case against Edom, with Israel, that it should be a case against America with Israel today, but it also should be a case against the church with individuals. Sometimes people are hurt because they're sinning and they're refusing to get it right. Sometimes people are hurt because we don't care enough to help them get it right. Do we know the difference? And here's the key. If we always have the right attitude, the right difference will be made. Even if that person refuses to get it right. Will we choose to do what we should instead of hearing God say afterwards, Oh, come on, Andrew, you should not have how many times he had to say that to you? You should not have. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Maybe right now there's someone on your heart, someone that you're praying for, someone you're concerned about. Maybe right now there's just you and your attitude. Maybe there's someone that, that you're so burdened with because you've tried and you've actually tried to do this for years and they just are horrible to you. Why don't you give it to the Lord and let's make a new idea. Why don't we do things differently?
And then we'll ask uh, Hank if he would to close the word of prayer. Don't forget everything tonight. Normal times tonight. Normal times, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your encouraging words, your word, how gently you deal with us you shouldn't have. And how often when we deal with the everyday things of life, the people, the salespeople, the, the workers, co-workers, even family members, and we find that we're looking at things the wrong way. And what a difference we could have made with restraint on our part, a softening word, or just a prayerful attitude. If we really believe that you are the God that changes us and gives us second chances, help us, Lord, to give each other that second chance that will make a difference. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.